Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to episode 99 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris and this is Chris. Hello. This time we read The Demon Pig, book two in the Quadruped series by Karen A. Brush. This was published in 1991 by Avon Books. Twitter user uh, at Gene Curl recommended this to us a little over a year ago because, quote, it is garbage, but for some reason I liked it when I was 12, end quote. Extra shout out to another Twitter user uh, at Laughter by Night for telling us that this book sounds a lot like a PS1 game called Tomba. I then looked up that game and it <laughs> seems pretty rad. I remember playing Tomba as like in one of those like preview the PS1 kiosks at video game stores when I was very young. <laughs> I don't think that did that game have a pig in it. I remember like a, the a main character. Char- I think the main character is a pig. I, I forget. There's something about pigs and fantasy. It's it's arguably sort of (laughs) i don't know sort of related anyway it was fun to read about so thanks uh if this is your first time listening to the terrible book club what we do here is we read books that we assume will be bad based on their cover title summary or some combination of the three sometimes we also read books that our patrons listeners or friends recommend like today this is a listener recommendation In general, though, we do the opposite of what most people do in a bookstore or while they're browsing online looking for an ebook. Usually, this experiment results in a disappointing read, but once in a while, we do actually end up liking the book. Um, Content warnings today. I mean, we have our usual barnyard language, and I don't know. Otherwise, we got what? Literal barnyard animals? There's really no... (laughs) For fucking once, there's there's no violence. Yeah, there's, there's some violence, but, like, that's nothing for this show. Like, I mean, we yeah. usually, this is going to be a fun time. I think we're going to have a good old, good old fantasy time today. So, uh, I good don't old think. barnyard romp. Yeah, I don't think there's anything too concerning. Like you said, there is some violence. Uh, there will be some mention of, you know, death in the story, but I can't. Death no, isn't like, a problem no, in this book. Else. It's really not a huge deal. Yeah, and I think there's one, there's like some imprisonment scenes, but again, they're, they're not permanent, so like, don't worry about it. It's cool. Uh, all right. Death so. in this book is more like getting sent to a checkpoint in a video game that's a little bit farther back than you'd like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you can still get back there. It's very true. All right, so uh, we have a, a special front of book tagline today on the cover of The Ooh. Demon Pig. It says, to save the world. A pig sometimes has to break the rules. From the author of The Pig, The Prince, and The Unicorn, uh, which is the first book in this series. I actually do not know how many books there are in this series. Uh, I have no clue. Anyway, the summary on the back of the book says, Trapped in the land of the dead. Famine grips the realm. Warlords are poised for battle on their borders. From the fleshless land, the evil hand of the Queen of the Dead sows havoc and hatred across the Nine Kingdoms. And all the fairy pigs have been cruelly imprisoned by the dread fungus folk, except one. He has no magical powers with which to confront the forces of terror that enslave his world. Yet this rotund, comfort-loving young warrior must venture into dark and terrible places to rescue his people, restore the peace, eliminate the evil pestilence, and, if he's lucky, find time for a bite to eat. Wait, Paris, hold on. I didn't read the back of the book. Did they give away where the pigs were on the back of the book? <laughs> That was the central mystery. <laughs> the whole book, you're like, where's the fairy pigs? Oh 
I guess if I had turned it over and read, it, I like, would not. Have... But, but, you're right, though. Like, I I typed this up a long time ago. Like, I didn't remember that part, but that's fucking hilarious. <laughs> like, back of the book spoiler. Like, <laughs> That's probably one of the more major plot points yeah, in a book I, whose plot is... I can't stop laughing. Yeah, dude. All right, that listeners. That is the only mystery in this uh, book, I would say, yeah, is listeners, where is the pigs. Listeners, that is one of very few mysteries in this. It is the central mystery where the main character is like, where is, where are, where's my family of pigs and my extended fairy pig family? Oh, no, where are they? And people are like lying to him about where they are. And the, so you think they're in different places until the very end and the back of the book just fucking tells you where they are. <laughs> so I, I hey, spent, hey, you know what this is like, Chris? It's like reading 140 pages of this book that didn't need to exist. Yeah. It's, it's like I that. spent two days reading this book and they just printed it out on the back of the book. <laughs> wow. Good fucking catch, Chris. All right. Well. I guess you guys well, already got a bit of the summary here. <laughs> um, I I can uh we can go uh do, do you want to talk characters and setting or do you want me to do that? You want me to read the summary? Um, have I'll have this? you read my summary and I'll just list out the. So we've okay. got a fun cast of characters. Admittedly, yeah. I, I, this great ensemble happening here. You've got our main uh protagonist, pig antagonist, quadruped. <laughs> pig antagonist, I love it. His two traveling buddies, Morag the Eel and Fairfax the Hedgehog. Morag is an eel that can fly through the air because magic. So just, just roll with that. Don't worry about how the eel is on well, land. Well, this is this is me. The whole I was like, Chris, is he a moray? If he's a moray, he has a a, a sheen of uh, ichor. He has an ichor covering his body. How does that work? And then Chris was like, Oh, don't worry. That he has like an aura that prevents him from contacting the ground. And I was like, God damn it. Um, then we have the royalty of the kingdom of Esselt, which is Glasgarian, his nephew Reander, um, and then Moragwen, who is, I guess, also part of that. Now she married Reander in the last book. She was originally from Raven. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, I'm just trying to <laughs> yeah, list yeah, characters. Get through this list. Um, okay, now we get to the fun part of how do we pronounce these fantasy character names, which Paris and I always have arguments about. Oh, oh yeah, get ready. It's it's uh, it's time for another round of how the fuck do you pronounce this fantasy name with Chris and Paris. Uh, and Chris and Paris always have radically different interpretations of these names, <laughs> as we'll prove today. So we've got, by my reading, Aviche, trickster oh, god. no. <laughs> no, it's Avis. Like avarice, but without the middle two letters. Avis. I like Aviche. It makes him sound a little Aviche. bit more mustache twirly, twirly to me. I like Avis. Then we have Neve, Queen oh, or, of the Dead. Or Nieve, as I pronounce it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> then we have the warlords of the land of Ravenor, the kingdom of Ravenor, who are Goriel, the Manslayer. Moragwen, and then there was a fourth one, but he never did anything. So who the fuck? I, forgot. I don't remember who that guy was. Yeah, yeah, because he didn't do guy. anything. Yeah, fuck that guy. Uh, they, they are ruled by the Black Unicorn, who is just a unicorn king of some kind. I, I guess he's he's just an evil unicorn. Yep. Which is a neat, a neat twist that the unicorn is evil here. Well, he's not. He's not even. I don't even know. He's he's just uh perceived to be evil. Um, yeah, definitely aggressive and unlike your typical unicorn, I would say. Then you have various monarchs of the other kingdoms. It, there's, I didn't even count how many there were. Usually there's seven in these books, right? There's always got to be seven kingdoms. No, there were, there were, there were quite a few, but, oh, we got, we got to go to the next round of how do we pronounce these fantasy names with, uh, two of those monarchs. Chris, you want to give sure. your interpretation? So two of them, they were brothers, and they are spelled A-O-D-H and A-E-D-H, which I pronounced Od and Ed. I think it's Odd and Ed. It's just Odd and Ed. <laughs> Odd and Ed is way better, actually. Yeah, it's so way I'm funnier. Go... I think it's Odd and Ed. Although I know that that's, I don't know. I feel like it could be, 
interpret it as being Gaelic or Welsh or something, and it'd probably be like or something. I don't know. I yeah. Can't fucking do. Apologies to our Gaelic listeners. <laughs> well, do you remember that episode where I had to pronounce uh the forest name in the woman you marry? Yeah. I didn't even try, I think. I, I got it, but I had to listen to someone say it like 30 times. And even then, it, it was just... Anyway, yeah. Odd and Ed. Odd and Ed are two kings, two brother kings. They don't like each other, though. Uh, then we have Ferenthal, the fungus lord. Or even Ru- Ferenthal. Ferenthal. <laughs> Ruler of the Mushroom Kingdom, I suppose. So he's just Bowser, right? Well, yeah, but Peach- he's a... But he's a mushroom. He's not. Yeah. It's the non-Mario Mushroom Kingdom. We have Glissane and her daughters who are Goriel's dead family. But they're, again, when you're dead, you just go somewhere else. Just wherever Neve is, she gets to tell you what to do instead of everyone else. And then finally, we have Sly Mold, the Sly Mold, who is a revolutionary mold. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, and uh, the main Quadro's pig herd, his sounder, as they put it. Yes, and these pigs are fairy pigs. They are magical. They have powers uh, unknown as to why pigs specifically are the powerful um, animal race in this in this uh, adventure. But all right, so we're gonna once again give you a summary breakdown of the actual story and the and plot elements, so that when we talk about our critiques, what we liked and didn't like, uh, you don't have to sit here and wonder what the fuck is going on, or at least you won't wonder as much. So, in book one, which we did not read, uh, but this is what we've gathered, uh, Quadro, our main, our hero pig, accidentally becomes the possessor of the key to the prison of the Black Unicorn, who is the ruler of Ravenor. Uh, Ravenor is a somewhat malevolent kingdom of beings that are more on the monstrous side. Quadro frees him with the key and becomes both famous and infamous for this act. Quadro himself is a young hogling. That's right. He's a baby pig, which is how he is referred to several times in the book, which, which makes it, I don't, I don't know, more confusing, better. I'm not, I don't think pigs live that long. So he's literally like a couple of years old. Not really sure. I do- doesn't at some point the elder pig in the herd say he's centuries old? Uh, maybe the elder pig, but not. Sure. I might so- be confusing that with the eel who just casually reveals that he's hundreds of years old. Correct. Yeah. So it seems like animals maybe in this story or in this world are long lived. But Quadro is a baby pig. Uh, The other thing to note about Quadro is that unlike his relatives, he does not have any magic powers. So he was a non-magical pig born into a family of magical fairy pigs. Um, In this book, the book we read, uh, picks up right at the end of the first book. So Quadro and his companions, Morag the eel and Fairfax the hedgehog, are returning to the forest where Quadro's family and herd live only to find it deserted. Informed by an ornery turtle that the pigs just up and left, Quadro becomes worried and turns right back around with his friends to go all the way back to Esselt, where they just came from, to ask his allies, Glasgarian, Reander, and Morrigan, for assistance in locating and saving his family. Along the way, many misadventures are had when Quadro lets the demigod trickster Avis loose, who for some reason was tied up in the basement of a farmer couple? Yeah, yeah we, we don't have get... to talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, Avis toys with Quadro throughout the entire book, capturing him for brief stints and then letting him go on a whim, threatening to take him to the fleshless land where Nieve, Queen of the Dead, rules. Avis seems to be smitten with Nieve and knows that handing Quadruped to her could put him in her good graces. But we don't, mind you, we don't find that out until the very, very end of the book. Meanwhile, war is brewing between the various kingdoms. Everyone suspects Ravenor and the Black Unicorn is responsible for the unrelenting rains that have been plaguing the rest of the kingdoms and ruining their crops. Negotiations fail, and every kingdom but Esselt wants to attack Ravenor. Ravenor. Esselt ends up caught in the middle, defending their once enemy in order to not provoke a greater war. Quadro tries to do something about all this. Fails. Ends up in the Mushroom Kingdom. 
and is almost roasted alive and consumed by sentient fungus. However, he runs into his family and herd, also imprisoned by the fungal realm. They reveal that they, as fairy pigs, control the weather and are subordinate to Niev of the fleshless land, who has ordered them to cause the rain. For some reason, they didn't tell this to Quadro at any point during his upbringing because he isn't magic like the rest of them. A slime mold, named Slime Mold, that he befriended when he let Avis loose, helps him get free by pointing out a hole in the wall that I guess Quadro needed a slime to point out, and then all of a sudden the mold is leading a protestariat revolution against the bourgeoisie mushrooms, allowing Quadro and his herd to escape. That's one of, one of the fun moments of the book. Avis swoops in, takes Quadro to the fleshless land to present to Niev, who refuses Avis's proposition of marriage. So, petty trickster that he is, Avis reweaves the threads of time so that the fairy pigs are no longer beholden to Niev, but everything else is the same, and thus the rains are no more, and war is averted. Ever, everyone lives happily ever after. The end. Hooray. Hooray. Now, we obviously have some bullshit to talk about. Um, do we want to talk about things we like first before we talk about things that we were confused by? I would say so, yes, because overall I did enjoy myself reading this book. Yeah, it was it was very enjoyable, but I think so. I have a particular soft spot for whimsical medieval fantasy animals. So, like, if you tell me, hey, our main character is a cute pig and a hedgehog and a magical eel and there's like a, a mold that's kind of sassy and I mean it's gonna be hard to make me not like it <laughs> like I just like right I love you. I love mouse guard I uh, you know red wall anything where you got little little animals living in a medieval fantasy world it's but just you didn't like warrior cats great. yeah that wasn't a medieval fantasy world <laughs> that was a modern day and it was actually that's a great example of how you can ruin it for me yeah we had cute <laughs> we had cute animals but like it was i it's been a while since we read that it was just so poorly designed um fuck god i should have thought more about warrior cats hey there's a phrase i never thought i'd say <laughs> in my life i should have thought more about warrior cats before this episode um yeah i mean because like Arguably, both of these books are for kids, but the thing, one of the things I like about the demon pig versus warrior cats is the demon pig, there's jokes in there for older people, for adults, um, and I think, and it doesn't, it doesn't cut corners with, like, vocabulary or writing. It's well written. It has some really clever moments, and it, you know, it gives kids the benefit of the doubt. It, it doesn't, it's like, hey... You're a kid who wants to read this book. We're just gonna show you some words, and if you don't, I don't know if you don't know what they are. Just fucking figure it out through context. Get a dictionary. Like it doesn't treat children as they don't know anything. Um, but then again, I guess I'm assuming that this is a children's book. I I feel that it is somewhat aimed at children, whereas yeah. Warrior Cats was probably more young adult, so technically aimed at an older audience. But this book gives. Presumably what is, again, being aimed at a younger set, a lot more credit when the words like sociopolitical come up in this very seriously. With that, They kind of assume you know it. Although at, at that point, that's Morag the eel talking to Quadruped, who does not care about what he's saying. So perhaps you're supposed to relate more to Quadruped, who does not care about Morag the eel's analysis of the sociopolitical context that resulted in guards on a bridge they're trying to cross. So one of the things I loved about this book was how clever some of the internal monologue and the dialogue was. It was great. I, I thought those were some of the best parts of the book. I felt like I really, yeah, I felt like I, I grew to like some of the characters. Um, dialogue is amazing in this book. Yeah, that, that's great. Absolutely the strong point. And it's well, well written overall, like it, like basic sentences. And, you know, there's very, very, very few typos, like no weird syntax is it's concise you know this was what 240 pages sorry yep. chris i didn't mean to cut you off go ahead uh, all i was gonna say is that the moment to moment stuff is very clever and even it sort of pokes fun at some aspect aspects of modern or not modern but regular fantasy let's say yeah that's uh, another thing i liked about it 
<clears throat> all all the royalty speaks in very sort of hoity-toity land. Not all of them, but most of them speak like normal medieval fantasy royalty, except for I guess quadrupeds, friends in Esselt. Who I mean, even then, I'm not even sure what point I'm trying to arrive at right now. <laughs> so well, I think. I well, <clears throat> so so this is another thing I liked about the book that I think Chris also did is that it does poke fun at some fantasy tropes. Um, so there's a point where, um, you know, there, uh, uh, Reander. Yeah. I think Reander or Glasgarian is in the ice palace that they live in. And he's like leaning against the window and he's sad because the negotiations are going so poorly. And he's like, fuck, we're going to end up in a war. And he's sitting there and he's like, uh, what, what does he say? Um, and like, if only we hadn't built this palace out of ice or like how impractical <laughs> it is. I'm sorry. It was, it was said in a much more, <clears throat> uh, punchy way than I'm saying it, but I just liked that. Uh, there was also like <clears throat> a point where, you know, this Avis or Aviche, however you want to say it, he's a trickster and it's pointed out that he's a weather God. And <clears throat> one of the times he has Quadro sort of captured on this like flying ship, he summons some weather fay sprites to help with the sails. To, they're like wind sprites. And Quadro convinces them to help him escape, to like carry him safely on a wind to the ground, basically. And um, one of them, you know, uh, or some, no, was it Morag? I, for, I think it was Morag. Somebody is like, Quadro how did you escape though? If he controls the weather and therefore the wind spirits that he summoned, like he let you get away, <laughs> you know, you yeah. didn't, you didn't escape really. Yeah. Um, and so I just, I thought moments like that were fun. Um, you know, slime old gets his name because quadruped quadruped miss hears him. Quadro meets him in a dank cellar and says, what are you? And slime old says, I'm a slime mold. And Quadro says, Slime Mold. And Slime Mold is very happy to be named Slime Mold because no one has ever given him a name. He likes the name Sly. Um, it's just, you know, silly stuff like that. It's really, f this book is very fun. It's very fun. If you want to just have like a fun little cute animal time, I guess it's there. Chris. I would like to bring up my favorite scene in the book at this okay. point, which is, I think this is right after Quadro falls out of the ship or is being is carried down by the face sprites. He's in a field and he's looking for some help because he's lost and he doesn't know how to get back to his friends. Mm -hmm. And he sees three slugs on the ground and he goes up to them and asks them for some help and he doesn't expect them to offer much because they're slugs. And then turns out there are three slugs of varying types where one is a poet and it, it start when quadruped says, can you help me? I'm lost. He starts going, aren't we all lost? Really? <laughs> Every one of us on the winds of fate. And then another slug pipes up and is like, no, he means literal latitude and longitude. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Pig. Can you give me exact descriptions of what you're looking for and perhaps a, a point of data? And it's it's just a silly scene. It has no bearing on anything, to be honest but, with but you. It's, but again, the, the interactions... It's the heart of the book. Yeah, the interactions are... Yeah, you put that well. Interactions are great. Um, oh, yeah, just some brief examples of why I think the writing is good. You know, here here's just like a... You know, it's got, it's got some good descriptive writing. We all know I'm a junkie for good descriptive writing. Uh, here's just a uh, sentence fragment. <clears throat> Where the sun was setting visible at last as a great red ball half dressed in purple clouds. What a nice way to describe a pretty sunset. Um, yep. Let's see. I also have some pages marked off, so I'm just going to read a little bit. Um, I like that. 71. It's, I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Paris, but is it only Niev that is described as a sort of mildly sultry way and every other female character is just a lady? Yeah, there, that. there's no, there's no creepy sexualization of anyone in this book, which was wildly refreshing for us here at the Terrible Book Club. Um, <clears> no, no point... sexual assault, nothing. Yeah, it's great. Avis, upon refusal of his proposition for marriage by the Queen of the Dead, 
he gets back at her by unbinding her pig herd from her, but he doesn't do anything beyond that, despite being able to control the literal threads of time. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, oh, so actually, page 71 is um, what you were talking about when Morag goes on one of his like sociopolitical rants. Um, ahem. These rumors about Ravenor are most disturbing, said Morag. Something terrible is happening to the kingdoms. This border patrol is a symptom of imminent sociopolitical upheaval. Fear of famine is causing dissension and increased factionalism, manifesting itself as a renewed sense of national identity and separatism. The border patrols are only the start. In the coming fight for survival, it's going to be every land for itself. Oh, said Quadruped. He was not entirely sure he understood what Morag was talking about, but it sounded quite dreadful. <laughs> like, it's just a bunch of passages like that. Um... Oh, I have page 186 is the slime mold monologue. So I'm going to get over there. Um. <clears throat> so the slime mold leads a revolution against the funguses that have oppressed him for so long, which is a hilarious scene because it's it's a mold leading a revolution against the mushrooms because they call him a protist. <laughs> yeah. <because laughs> um. He doesn't have cell walls or something. It says, uh, here it is. It's me, said the voice. The slime mold. I've come to help you escape. I don't know why I'm Mickey Mouse. <laughs> why, said Quadruped. Aren't you a fungus too? You gave me a name, said the slime mold. The other fungi never would. They all look down on me. They're not sure if I'm a fungus or a protist. We are fruiting bodies of the great spiritual mycelium. Ha! They are none of them willing to practice what they preach. Just because I lack dividing cell walls, I'm as multinucleate as the rest of them and a lot less sensile. Sorry, Cecile. But yeah, I just, silly. just lo- it's it's a lot of fun. Um, that's great. That's really good. And and there's just a lot of little other details. Like the uh, Quadro mentions that the use of old magic smells like fruit. <laughs> like you know, yeah, just a fun creative thing. I like that the hedgehog just goes and hibernates a third through the book. And isn't seen again until the end, where it's spring again, and the end of the book is him waking up and saying, oh, oh, this is earlier than I wanted it to be, fuck. (laughs) Yeah, it's just like your friend that sort of makes an effort to help you and then goes, oh, fuck this, I'm gonna go watch (laughs) (laughs) TV. The hedgehog just sleeps for most of the book. Uh, yeah. Um... The I will say the pace is really good. You're never bored. You're always invested because something crucial is always happening. There's, you know, for example, it's always like life or death scenarios. People are missing. There's a mysterious you stranger. You cannot skim. You you cannot skim this book. Things can happen in two sentences. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty uh it's pretty quick. Um, there are just some funny other funny moments where Quadro learns a lesson. He literally learns like don't take candy from strangers because Avis gave him. Uh, an enchanted sugar plum and it made him docile and allowed Avis to kidnap him. And he was like, Oh, I knew I shouldn't have taken candy from strangers. I was like, yeah, it's a solid lesson. Um, Oh, there are just some other things. Like there's some banquet and there's three orchestras playing together at the same time, which I just was like, good fucking luck with that dude. I believe um, it was played as silly too. To yes, just have that. <laughs> they're all, Oh God, I'm, I'm trying to imagine it. It's like medieval guitar center. Oh, oh, <laughs> God, why? Oh, Medieval Guitar Center would be terrible because, like, <laughs> you'd have these, these you know, cultural hubs where you got instruments from all over the world. And so, you know, you're like, oh, okay, it's a little weird. It's maybe, like, some, some I don't know, what's a Medieval kind I should know. I should, I'm sitting in a room. I don't know. This dulcimer is fine. It's a bunch of dulcimers. <laughs> I'm sitting in a room with fucking medieval instruments and I'm like, what's a medieval instrument? Uh, you know, and then, you know, some asshole walks through with like a fucking bagpipes. Oh, Jesus. That How would... am I supposed to test out my hurdy gurdy if I can't hear it over your bagpiping? That's true. But now I'm thinking I need to check the actual origin date of bagpipes. I don't know if. No, they're. Yeah, they're older than they're old. Fuck. Paris, I think our listeners will let this slide if we don't. If we're don't anachronistic know. about medieval instruments. Well, I'll consult an expert after the episode and get back to you. What about the pig in a horse sidecar? Oh, fuck, yeah. Okay, all right. So imagine you're going into battle, but, like, you're a baby pig, and and you got to get all suited up in armor, and then you're not just charging into battle 
with you know big you know maybe if you had like big metal tusks or something no none of that you get put in a sidecar on a horse that's charging into battle to me that's like a recipe for instant death just dead (laughs) fuck because like how how does everyone not because Typically, battle horses don't have sidecars, right? So, like, <laughs> yeah, there's not like so, the side jouster, yeah, the so backup I, spear. I think that was really funny. I kept forgetting that quadruped was in chainmail for most of the book, and it, it, every time I remembered, it was hilarious again. Yeah, and he's always like, "Oh, the chainmail's uncomfortable. I just want to be warm." And I'm like, "It is uncomfortable for the record." Chris, there were so many times when Quad- Quadro was talking about how uncomfortable his like blanket or chainmail was, or how he wanted a snack, and I was like, "Is this pig, Chris?" <laughs> I was like. I'm a man just, of simple taste, and I did relate to Quadruped very much. It just sounded, it just reminded me of times where you were like, I'm so mad. And I'm like, Chris, did you eat? And then you'll eat like half a box of cheeses, and you'll be like, I feel better. I'm like, <laughs> it's not always <laughs> half a box. Sometimes it's a quarter or a third. <laughs> Sometimes it's a whole. Uh, hey, man, cheeses are delicious. I don't, I don't fault you yeah, for that. that. The king of all snacks. Um, yeah, I think, I think I also appreciated that the rulers were bargaining for the lives of the common people and they were all willing to sacrifice themselves. Uh, like, I all know, the, the council. what a change. Yeah. Every, and then, sorry. All the royalty is ready to sacrifice their lives so that the commoners don't get fucked over. Yeah. Like they're all, even the shittiest and sort of evil, uh, rulers on the council are all like, yeah, we're just worried about our people. I was like, fuck, this is, that's actually. <laughs> this is definitely a fantasy novel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, my heart. Um, And then <laughs> there are scenes where uh, towards the end where Quadro finally gets reunited with his family, the fairy pigs uh, in the fungal lands, but they're all, um, bewitched they they've been fed similar to when like quadra was fed an enchanted sugar plum by avis niev has told the fungus people to feed the fairy pigs uh this like slop that keeps them loyal to her and every time there was a scene with him talking to the pigs while they were bewitched i all i could think of was like the all these pigs wearing maga hats and talking about trump instead of niev like it just (laughs) it just sounded like she won the election yeah She's the rightful ruler of the fleshless land. <laughs> yeah. Um. You'll see. The states won't certify it. You'll see. Why do we? Of course we started the rain. All those people deserve to lose their crops. <laughs> just, it just sound, yeah. Just. It's... All right. Well, that's All a right. lot of stuff we enjoyed. Yeah, I would. And there's say, much oh, to like. This book is. An enjoyable read um, if you're just looking for, like, a real casual chuckle. Maybe maybe you got a, sh- a bus trip or a short plane ride or something and you want to have a good time. This is here for you. But there were some things we did not like about it. So let's, uh, let's get into those. For just right up top, the major issue is the level of deus ex magica in this book Oh, rivals yeah. or even outpaces the sort of truth series yeah it's pretty bad uh you are asked to just accept all kinds of insane <laughs> shit without any explanation or if an explanation is given it's equally bizarre and you're like what that didn't explain it's like oh oh yeah the rain was being caused by the fairy pigs what oh they can control the weather what <laughs> like why though i don't also they never told quadruped just because he's not magical as well which seems mean that's like you're leaving your son out of the whole reason the fairy pigs are kind of doing anything yeah that's fucked up to be like oh you're not not... to hear about any of the weather changing meetings or something he's just constantly excluded from knowing about that (laughs) so on on top of the fairy pig stuff right at the top of the book where introduced to the four dead warlords of Ravenor who just get to come back because the unicorn calls them back and that's it. The queen of the dead can't even keep them there because the black unicorn says, nah, you guys aren't dead anymore. I refuse to certify the results of your death. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, that shit just happens all the time. It's like all these fucking faithless death electors. Like, get out of here. <laughs> you know, this asshole's dead. And, and somebody else is like, no, he's not. It's like, no, he's fucking dead. He's <laughs> unconscious. His soul is gone. And, you know, the Ravenorian elector is like, nah, no. And I, that just happens. This is one of the things I think Chris and I both disliked. There, it's another fantasy book where there just is no real consequence. There's no real consequence. Everyone who dies comes back from the dead. I I, I don't know if there's maybe one or two no, exceptions, but most there, people who die come back, I will say. And that's mostly because most people who are dying that we know are from Ravenor, and there's some kind of weird immortality thing going on in Ravenor only, if you remember. It's yes. like Ravenor, Ravenorian people can come back from the dead because of the black unicorn. Fairy pigs and even, I guess, regular pigs can go in and out of the fleshless land without having to die first. For yeah, but just reasons. pigs, though. But just pigs, though. I don't know. But everyone else is subjugated under Niev when they die. I think it's just that in this book, it's only Ravenorian people. There's that one thing with one of the princesses of one of the kingdoms, a Shaned, actually, making a reappearance. That name Which making a reappearance. Which we both laughed. Chris and I certified that we both laughed about it. We were texting about it, and I was like, But yep. she only came back because she was possessed by the spirit of a Ravenorian warlord's dead wife, who, when the ghost kisses him, he dies too. Which, but he can again... Still- yeah, I what like how? Yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> he can still he can still come back though, so that's not even a big deal. There's even a scene where he's dead again with his dead wife in the fleshless land, and Quadra's trying to convince him to come back to help out the kingdoms, and he's like, "I mean, I'm dead, and it's fine. I don't care if other people die. Seems great to me. I get to be with my wife and kids again." Yeah, honestly. Dying seems fine. There's, it doesn't seem. Is there a hell that we just don't know about? Because the yeah, flesh. I think is... if you're, if you're not from Ravenor, you turn into a zombie under Niev's control. But if you're mm. from Ravenor, you don't have to do that, for reasons. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. I don't quite remember that, but I trust you. Um. Yeah. So, so the fact that there's no consequence of death, and, and it's. <sighs> It's just something that I wish the book had poked more fun at because if it had, it would have been a great parody of a fantasy book, right? But it didn't take all of those opportunities. It only it only poked fun a few times. And I think sometimes, you know, in the dialogue, but I just really wish it had gone a little a little like full bore with the um with the picking fun at fantasy tropes. I really think that would have made this book shine a little brighter. Um but yeah, some other things. So something that really sucked for me is uh, from, let's see, page uh, 50 to page 193, those 143 pages just, nah, didn't matter. Just didn't matter. Didn't need to be there. All it did was, prov- I mean, it provided like some fun, but to the plot, nope. There's some war a Bruin and a trickster god is let loose. Can we actually take this point to talk about why was the trickster god shackled in the basement of a random farmer couple? Dude, that is one of the biggest mysteries of this book. I'm so glad that you put that in your notes because I, I forgot to. But yeah, it's it's really strange. How So the whole thing with Avis is... um. Quadro and his friends at the very beginning when when Quadro Morag and uh f- fair f- Firefox what the fuck <laughs> Firefox the hedgehog <laughs> Google Fairfax. F- g- Google Firefox and Safari left the house and <laughs> went out into the magical internet um <laughs> sorry uh oh god no it would be Quora, Quora Firefox and uh <laughs> And Mozilla. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. They must battle the evil Netscape Navigator. Worse still. Queen of the dead internet pages. <laughs> Worse still, the internet explorer who thwarts <laughs> all in his path. <laughs> anyway. I 
I gotta. A lot of laugh breaks this episode. <laughs> oh, it's okay. We'll fill them with zany sounds or something. I forgot what we were even talking about before we got into. Oh, the in the I basement was, with I Abbas. Was ex- I was explaining how how Abbas being in the basement even happened. So, Quadro Morag and Fairfax uh, leave. At, you know, after discovering that his parents have disappeared, they turn right back around and go to Esselt. And on the way, of course, it's been raining the whole time. It's been raining and raining for days. It's getting really bad out. So on their journey, they're getting very tired. It's nighttime. They need to rest. They decide to roll that actually Quadro drags all his friends into this shitty plan. He's like, let's just ask the nice farmers. And Morag and Fairfax are like, nah, dude, they might fucking eat us. Like, we can't trust (laughs) random people, dude. Come on. And he's like, no, I'm going to do it. You know, and he walks up and knocks and, you know, they get roped into it. And at first, the farmer couple seems fine. Um, you know, they give them some dinner. They welcome them in. They're like, yeah, you can stay for the night. No no prob. No prob. It's cool. Then I actually really like how the author writes this. Quadro wakes up in the middle of the night and overhears them talking about murdering them. Uh, but it's described as though Quadro is having a dream. And it happens a couple of times in the book where... I think it's just maybe a perspective of like Quadro as a young pig, you know, as a, as a, a child, basically being like, Oh, well, there's people talking about murdering us. That can't possibly, you know, I must be, you know, I must be sleepwalking or whatever, you know, dreaming. Uh, but you know, of course it's true. And he, I can't remember if he goes into the basement to hide or if they throw him in there because they find, I think they find him. He gets tossed in the basement. He's like, fuck, what am I going to do? That's when he meets Sly Mold. And as he's he's in the basement, he goes all the way to the back. And there's another room where this just bedraggled, withered old man is chained up to the wall. And, you know, Quadro's like, fuck, what the hell did this guy do? You know, and he had just heard the farmer and his wife talking about murdering him. So he's like, well, if they have someone chained up down here. They, this person must not be bad, you know? And the man who's chained up is like, please, water. You know, he can barely talk. And Quadro's like, oh, yeah, yeah, man, you got it. I'm going to get you some water because he saw a pail of water in the basement. And so he goes to get him a drink, and the slime mold is like, no, don't give him water. And Quadro's like, but why not? That's the thing to do, this poor man. And the slime mold's like, you don't know who he is, you know? And... Quadro gives him one drink and he can see that the man is visibly changed from one ladle of water. He's like, wow. He asks for a second and then a third. And as you know, all, all fey things, you know, once you do that three times, Avis regains his life force and is able to just break out of the chains. And that's when he's like, well, Quadro, you know, I'll give you three wishes. Cause you, you gave me three ladles and freed me. And, um, that's how he gets out of this whole, he and his friends get out of this whole situation. It's how they end up not getting eaten by the farmer couple. But yeah, Chris brings up a great point. Avis throughout the rest of the book is an all powerful God who can reweave the <laughs> strands of time. What, how did a farmer and his wife get him chained up in the basement? Because it, so he's a, he's like a weather based deity. So it seemed like he was dehydrated. They like put him in a God dehydrator. They were like, Hey, you want God jerky? Let's just get him in there. We're going to bake him. Let's get him nice and nice and There's crisp. no reasonable explanation for this whatsoever no. as to why the weather trickster demon was in the possession of some random farmer. It's not like the farmer couple was monstrous or magical. They're just, a, they were a mundane and a, as far yeah. as we knew. They were mundane characters. Um, so there, there, was, like... there was a Miller and his wife, but whatever. Yeah. yeah. I, I do like that in the morning, uh, Quadruped still kind of thinks it was a dream. And when the farmer couple isn't around, they just have breakfast. And then Morag the eel makes everyone wash the dishes and clean up after themselves. And yeah, I was that's... like, hell yeah, Morag. Yeah, I was. I remember messaging Chris and being like, Chris, I am Morag. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm Quadro and you're Morag and Fairfax is somewhat. <laughs> uh, Tris. Oh, yeah, that's true. Obviously. Oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> Fairfax is totally dressed, like, complains and goes to sleep. (laughs) Has something better to do than this bullshit. I mean, she's not wrong. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. It was very fun to imagine that that array of us uh, 
superimposed on these characters. But um, yeah, so the only the only feasible things I can think of, I have two two options here. Maybe when they bought the mill, he was already there. Free trickster but, god in the basement. But well, but here's the weird thing though, is like they they knew like, oh god, you can't give him three drinks of water because by the time they got downstairs, Quadro had already given him two and they could see that. So they knew his deal. Um so I don't know if, you know, like they're you know, you know, you're like buying property in a fantasy world. And you get a really good price. Sometimes <laughs> if the previous owner's like, all right, this mill, there's nothing wrong with it. And you're like, really? I don't know, man. This price is too low. Like, you're only asking 50 gold for a whole ass mill and a house. Like, what, what's, I don't know. Like, got plumbing problems? Oh, no, there isn't even plumbing to have problems with. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Rest uh, assured. Yeah, like, what, window window pane issues? Oh, no, there's just clapboards. There's no glass yeah. to even be concerned with. And you're like, well, I don't understand. What's wrong with it then? And they're like, well, well, you know, if you, if you buy the mill... The, all right, there's a clause. So, um, some mills, before a certain time, were, um, were built with a... Uh, Trickster God tied up in the basement. You know, it's like, it's like, um, a what? so we have, so we have a, a trickster God tied up in the basement release form. Uh, so, so since <laughs> 1978, we've, we've asked any new owners to, to fill this out, <laughs> to certify that they are aware that there could be a trickster God tied up in the basement. Um, it is your responsibility to deal with that. It if is. You yeah. Find the trickster God. Yeah, you know so, you have to bring in the trickster god removal people. It's a whole thing. You got to get out of the mill for like two weeks. Yeah, it's a, and it's really hard. Those specialists are hard to find. You know, you got to like. Mean, it, but it doesn't really matter as long as you don't have any kids living with you. Yeah, exactly. If you don't have any kids or um small curious whimsical animals, you're <laughs> totally good. You're, you're good. <laughs> You know, and you're like, all right, I guess I'll see. You know, I've heard, you know, I think There's I've heard about this. There's not any better rates around here. All you know, the other know... mills are 1,000 gold. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I had, you know, I had a friend who had a, you know, trickster god tied up in his basement claws, and he's fine. You yeah. know, they didn't have kids. They didn't get any his, pets, and they're, they're his fine. His threads of fate didn't get rewoven at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was cool. They didn't get murdered by the trickster god in the basement. Uh. Anyway. um. <laughs> <laughs> That's our trickster god lease signing bit <laughs> you know lead paint is a real problem be careful yeah <laughs> don't don't eat paint chips don't don't lick your trickster gods in your basements um yeah so that's what i'm see i'm thinking like they somehow got saddled with this by some other god and we're just like i don't know we're mundane maybe they got something out of it because you're right it doesn't make sense that they would have imprisoned him uh, but I can see no other way out of this. I, I'm, I'm saying sketchy real realtor made them sign the the, the clause. You know, that's this. So much of that stuff in this book that you really just have to roll with. Even just more eggs, I can float through the air. Yeah, thing. as a moray eel. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't make any sense. It does result in some cute scenes where he wraps himself around bedposts and stuff to go to sleep. Yeah, which is really fun. cute. But yeah, it is. You do have to suspend like all of your disbelief, <laughs> and which is hard for me a lot of the time. But but I feel like especially I have with a... pigs manipulating things with hooves. Yeah, I have a. Well, no, he always grabs things with his mouth. He doesn't often use his hooves. There's but... definitely a couple of scenes where he uses a hoof to manipulate something. Yeah, yeah. I think though, with me. You know, if you've ever listened to the show before, you know I have trouble um, suspending my disbelief. It's easier when you're reading a book that's making fun of itself, its genre, and also is totally out the window, kind of, you know, crazy. It's yeah. a lot easier to accept that than like, no, you need to take me really seriously, but A and B. And you're like, well, that's really hard to do, you know? Um, anyway. That's I agree. I don't think if this book was trying to be a little bit more serious or heavy handed, it would not have flown. But since pretty much all of the magical stuff is pretty hand wavy, 
I'll roll with that for now. It's, it's, when you just hit me right out the gate with it and it continues to be that way and when clearly the strength of the book isn't necessarily the magic system, but the <laughs> characters and well, their like, conversations with each other. Right, and again, I think the reason that I I am okay with it is um is again that it's it's a bit of a parody of it, you know, of itself and the genre that it's in. So that's why that stuff is okay. Back to the point I was getting to 10 fucking minutes ago. Yeah, 140 pages of this book didn't matter, which I was pissed about. So <laughs> at page 50, Quadro has already has met Slime Mold um, and Avis, and Avis has kidnapped him. And then on page 193, Avis kidnaps him again and takes him to the fleshless land, just like he was going to do on page 50. To me... And- Oh, that fucking There's the war me off. stuff in the middle, which is for sure some tension, and trying to find his herd is some source of tension if you didn't read the back of the goddamn book. So I there's yeah. that. But in the end, Avis just lets him go a bunch of time. He he even says, I'll let you go for now, pig, but whenever I want to take you, I'm gonna take you to the fleshless land. And eventually he does, and he holds quadruped up to Niev and says, Look, I got you this pig, which I I guess Niev didn't like Quadruped because she messed with her plans to cause war. So that no, no, no. war. No, no, no. She's mad at him because he released the Black Unicorn. Okay, yeah. And that right? meddles. Oh, yeah, because the Black Unicorn can then recall people from the Fleshless Land if they're from Ravenor. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't like that. So she wants Quadruped to be under her control so that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, because she, cause she had, like, sent the key for the Black Unicorn's prison somewhere but it fe- it literally fell on quadruped in the first book and that's how he got involved and then he fucked up her plan whether it was by freeing the black unicorn or, or other stuff i forget but yeah you're right he, he fucked her shit up she hates him but even when she is presented with quadruped she refuses evis's proposal for marriage and he's like all right fuck you then and he it's described as there's a literal object in front of him that is made of several millions of billions of tiny threads, and he finds the one that is Quadruped's herd that is linked to Niev's thread because she commands them for reasons, and mm-hmm. he manipulates it such that the herd is no longer beholden to her, but everything else is the same? Which so doesn't the, make any sense at all. The pigs were still in the fungus prison, which they were only put there because they were under Niev's control to control the weather. That's why the fungus people wanted them. So why would they have stolen the pigs? Yeah, they and were what, never under Niev's control to begin with. Right, and what was causing the rain if it wasn't Niev If Niev couldn't order them. them to do that. How would, so, how would, how would Quadro have ever gotten the key to the black unicorn and and all I mean I guess you can say that perhaps other things could have happened to cause that stuff but it just uh, doesn't sit well with me it's not a good <laughs> when the way not to a good solve way to your end problem it. is a god deciding I'm just going to make this not a problem it's yeah. very unearned well and and again if if it had been a lot more direct about making fun of that as a fantasy trope it would have been great, but it it felt more earnest than I wanted yeah. it to. <laughs> like, I wanted it to be like, you know, yeah, isn't this fucking dumb? There's just no consequences anymore. And that way would have been fine. But it didn't it did not go far enough to make fun of itself and fantasy tropes. And that's why that didn't work for me. I would have even allowed it if something that Quadruped had done or said to cleverly convince Avis to reweave things in his favor or even if there was just like like the slime mold thing when slime mold came back to free quadruped from being imprisoned by the fungus people why not do something like that but with the whole avis plot as well it wasn't even that it was just avis was like all right fuck you then i'm not gonna take your pig away from you and the the reasoning so the one glimpse we get at the magic system is when avis and niev are having their fight well, not physical, but their disagreement, which makes Avis do this time unweaving thing. And Avis says, ah, well, if Niev fucked up, if she broke the rules, 
that means I get more power. So it's a direct consequence system where people are seem to be on differing sides. And if someone on that side breaks a rule, the other side gets an equivalent amount of boosted power. It sounds like a terrible system that, like, I, I don't know, but that's how he describes the magic system. The balance is what it's called. And so that's why he has the power to just basically shove Niev and, I don't know, down to the ground and make her, like, mute and inert. Like, freezes her or something she while was he the does one this. that sent Goriel's wife, Glissane, out as a ghost to, like, snatch Goriel up again. And that was a huge no-no for some yeah. reason. Yeah, I mean, even though, yeah, like, I don't get why it's a no-no for her, but then the black unicorn can just be like, you're not dead, and you're not dead, and you're not dead, but... <laughs> I think the but... unicorn is recalling people back to life, but there's something bad about the Queen of the Dead sending a ghost out into the living realms. But why that is, yeah, but like, well, that's yeah. just, why is that the rule? I, yeah. have, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and the, and the whole ending is just this paint-by-numbers fantasy, like, happily ever after, where no one really died. Uh, everyone is saved. All the rulers come to their senses at the same time, and they all sue for peace, and ta-da. And Avis is just out there. Yeah, he's just like, peace, I'll fuck <laughs> with just, you later, <laughs> bitches. <laughs> like, yeah, that's just, I don't know. I, I assume some of the balance was somehow restored after the reweaving or something, and so now they're back on equal footing. But they're they're just still both Niev and Avis are just out there doing their thing. So, yeah, I'm sure um, maybe that's for book three, right? Is there a book three? Yeah, I don't know. I I think I tried to figure. I'm gonna check the old Google. Um. By the way, the reason it's called Demon Pig is in the middle of the book, Quadruped is cast as some kind of demon pig symbol because he he helped Ravenor, and then rumors spread throughout the land that he is of some magical comport that can be taken advantage of, and some people try to kidnap him sometimes. That's really it. Yeah, he is he is both, like I said, both famous and infamous. There are some people who consider him like the savior white pig, and others that consider him the evil demon pig. Um there's Let's some ruffians can... in a field that try to abscond with him and they are taken out by Morag and Fairfax, I believe. Once again, just like a little side scene that's kind of fun. A little scary, I would say. A kid reading that book might be a little bit scared by that scene. There's some violence in this book. People get stabbed to death and like crushed and there's some gory detail described. I think there's some arms and yeah. stuff cut off here and there. Yeah, there are, certainly. Uh, certainly. Um, so strangely, The Pig, The Prince, and The Unicorn, the first book in the series, was published in 87. The Demon Pig was published in 91, and then there's nothing after that. Okay. So this is just That's, the end, then. Well, it doesn't feel... Did it feel like... I mean, I felt like... You, a two-book? I don't know. Weird. We're, maybe we're just too used to, like, nine-book yeah. epics here. I don't know. It's so odd. I definitely expected there to be at least three. Uh, so there's also oh, not a know. lot of... I, I was unable to find much information about this author at all. Um, yeah, I, okay. this is a real niche thing that I don't think a lot of people know about. Sort of our bread and butter, I would say. It's a thing <laughs> I, ho I hope to find, honestly, Paris. This is exactly what I hope to find. Something that's kind of charming and fine and not a lot of people know about. Yeah, I mean... <clears throat> I don't know that I think if, if somebody were, were okay, so let, let's go to like, let's go to the, can we fix it section? So can yeah. we fix it? <clears throat> Chris, why don't you go ahead? I would say that, like you said, either lean way more into the parody levels of stuff and make that deus ex magica stuff a little bit more overtly silly. It would have helped. Uh, and like I said, I wanted Quadra to somehow be clever or trick Avis or befriend him in order to get these circumstances rewoven in his favor instead of just him being in the right place at the right time for Avis to use him to be petty at someone that slighted him. 
And the the major downfall is the very hand wavy plot, but the setting and dialogue is and characters in general are really great. So I wouldn't fix that. So I I would go with you. Just lean into that parody a little harder. So the hand wavy stuff is more viable. Also, so whenever we talk about like, can we fix it or should someone read it? I always think like, you know, if someone asked me, Hey, what should I read? This wouldn't be the first thing that comes to mind, but if someone was looking for pure fun, fantasy with clever components, I would recommend this. If they're looking for pure fun um, or if they're like, hey, I like, you know, Redwall or Mouse Guard, but I want something a little jollier, a little, you know, a little more comical, I'd say, yeah, you know, this, this is, this is a fun book. Um, so I think I did. I did overall like it, although I was frustrated by reading what I felt was 140 pages of nothing, uh, if we're talking about relevance to plot. But, um, yeah, I like Chris said, the setting, the dialogue, the the internal monologues, the characters themselves, some of the, the jokes are good. You know, I never... Yeah, oh, yeah, another great thing. I never felt there was, like, a dad joke. All the jokes were solid. Yeah. And some of them were were really subtle and excellent. Um yeah, the 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 really the the way this book is crafted is really perfect. Like it's just it's well written, good easy to read, fun to read. Um but again, yeah, I think um just didn't go hard enough on the parody part to really get a higher rating. But I did, yeah, I think it's um Solid book for solid book, you know, yeah. Casual read, for for sure. Solid book, the Demon Pig. Um, yeah, I don't know why we were recommended the second book and not the first one, but we don't make we don't question weird recommendations. We just read them. Yeah. Um. So Speaking thank you, Mister. Recommenders. <clears throat> oh yeah, thank you, Mister Gene Curl, once again for recommending this over a year ago. Finally made it uh, onto the show. If you do not want to wait a year plus for us to read your recommendation, you can become a patron at the $10 a month level or higher. Um, if you want access to fun content, but you don't want to make us read a book, you can become a patron at the $5 or $1 a month level or amounts in between. If you're feeling generous, um, for some fun rewards. And, uh, our patrons have been really glorious this year. They have supported us through, uh, Probably the most trying time any of us has, has flipped through. <laughs> yeah, so. this of all years, especially, it's wonderful to have the support that we have. And we're definitely going to dig more into this next episode. But yeah, and I, we're I saying just, it again. Yeah, and I know we talked about it a little before. I made, you know, made some posts on social media. But yeah, goddamn, is 2020 not the year I would have expected to see the show grow, to see our patron flock enlarge uh, and biggin? Uh, to see, you know, um, to get more interaction with you listeners. It's just been, it's been heartwarming in a year where our hearts all need little sweaters. So thanks. Thanks for being that sweater. Even if you just left a comment on YouTube or send us a message on any, you know, Instagram or Twitter or what have you, we've gotten quite a bit of those. And those have been really, really lovely to read pretty much every single time. So please continue to engage with us as much as you would like. So we can hear from you and hopefully build a better show. Um, I have some goals for next year, but maybe we'll save that for next episode. Yeah. Um, so, you know, of course, not everybody, especially this year, can afford to be a patron um, and pay anything every month. That's fine. You can also go to kofi.com and just that's ko-fi.com and find Terrible Book Club. You can just toss us a dollar whenever you want or a five dollar or a twenty dollar Internet bill. Um, at us whenever whenever you feel if you if you can't do a monthly thing or you know in lieu of money we also accept such gifts as good reviews um we also accept sharing the show and telling people to listen to it um we accept nice posts on reddit and book forums nice posts on goodreads wherever wherever you can you know get that terrible you word don't even out have to where... tell us about it or anything it could be your little secret that you did yeah you don't have to you don't have to bring receipts we're just yeah. suggestions you know 
But uh, or you know, you can just keep listening every week, and that's also great. If you do want to contact us, you can. You have many avenues. Um, you can send us a message on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Goodreads, or you can send an email to terriblebookclub at gmail dot com. Um, right now, our patron ranks are have swollen to a mighty eighteen. Uh, wow! And those eighteen folks are Dari, Greg, Will, Veronica, D, Lynn, Sinya. Yakub, Bobby Black Cat, Jen Cena. Not John Cena, as someone, I forget, I think one of the other patrons was like, I thought you were saying John Cena this whole time. I was <laughs> if like, no, only. That's, it's like, no, that's just, that's just someone's name. Jen Cena, the lovely Jen Cena, Mayo Cat, Elliot, Kieran, Martin, Jay, Scott, Luchek J again, and our newest patron, CTAP1, you didn't put your real name in there, so your username is. I mean, I don't think Mayo Cat is anyone's real name either, Paris. I don't know, man. It's fucking 2020. (laughs) Bobby Black Cat, maybe that's somebody's name. I don't know. Actually, Bobby Bobby Black Cat does actually sound like it could be someone's name. Like Bobby first name and then Black Cat as a last name. Yeah, you know what? You're right. Feasible. Well, thank you, CTAP1. CTAP1. So the next episode is fucking episode 100, y'all. 100 terrible wowie, books. Wowie, <laughs> Even uh, though technically some of them were lost to the sands of time, we promise you we've, we're coming up on our 100th terrible book here. You know, what's, you know what's scarier, though, is that we've actually already hit episode 100 because of those lost ones. Because I, I actually was able to find through digging through um, cached internet web pages... <laughs> That our original episodes that were lost were like, it was like one, two, three, four, five, six. And then it was like six B, seven B. So I think technically we're maybe at like one Oh four at this point, but fuck it. Those episodes aren't real. So it doesn't matter. Um, it's fine. We can choose any history. We want to, we've rewoven the threads of fate. (laughs) You know what, Chris, the balance was fucking Uh, off in 2020. So we are doing what we want. (laughs) We are changing numbers. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Bend to our will. Next episode is episode 100. We are going to try to make it special. Uh, we are going to stream it on Twitch. We are going to do an award show for um, some fun categories. We we actually asked for um, ideas from you all, and we got a ton of ideas. We actually got so many responses, we couldn't include them all. So <laughs> thank you so much for all of the responses. But... um. You know, we've got so it's it's just gonna be like a silly thing where Chris and I award books uh certain what's the fucking word? Accolades? No. No. Superlatives? Yes, thank you. Superlatives. Um yeah. So it it'll be a good time. We're of course, we're also we're also reading a book for that episode. But it's a very short one, so the discussion... It's very short and very stupid. I've already read it, so <laughs> I can tell you it's going to be a fucking short analysis. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about the book, and then we're going to do... Very short and very show. stupid is my Tinder bio. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not... The, you're I'm you're not, average I'm not very, of average yeah. height. Are you not? Yeah, Yeah, I'm like 5'7 um, or something. I don't know. I don't count that as much as some people make me think I sh- should... Even though... Yeah, what is wrong with people in height? Why is that a thing? Was... Like, why can't you just be like, why can't you just look at someone and go, am I attracted to them or not? Like, why does it have to be about, like, all these prerequisites? Like, just just let yourself take in a person's essence and decide if you like it. Terrible book club. Take in a person's <laughs> essence. <laughs> No, you never know. I, th- I think having uh, arbitrary standards like like a height is silly. You know, obviously yeah. you should have standards about other things. Like, hey, you're gonna treat me well, but yeah, height. Dating is- advice with Terrible Book Club. We're we're hitting all the buttons tonight. <laughs> oh yeah. Just, How about just we just let people know on what day we're planning to possibly Twitch stream episode 100? Oh yeah. So episode 100 will be Twitch streamed on uh, opening my calendar. Um. Calendar is loading. Oh, on Saturday, November 28th. So that is this upcoming Saturday, if you are listening to this on release day. Um, so Saturday, November 28th, 
We are not sure of the time, but we are do- going to do our best to pick a time that accommodates our many European listeners and patrons. So uh, we'll try to pick something probably earlier in the day for us here in the U.S. So um, I think we're, we're looking at early afternoon, right? We're looking at like yeah. maybe 1 or 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but we are not. We'll, we'll post about it online when we pick a time. Yeah. Um, we're obviously recording this in advance of of release day so we're gonna sort this out and let y'all know um yeah i think i think that's that's all we're doing for the yep. episode uh but yeah it's just i think 100 episodes is a pretty good achievement we've been doing this for uh since About well four or five years yeah i mean technically it's been almost six but we did take like a year and a half hiatus so Let's just say five and call it a day. We, I mean, we've yeah. been on the air consistently for three full years from actually from inauguration from President yeah. Trump's inauguration. That was the start. And and we're oh, man, that's oh, Jesus. Yeah. So it's been four. Sorry, four, four full. What? Four full years. I don't know. <laughs> 2017, 2018, 19. This is the end of 20. Sorry. Excuse me. We have been on the air consistently <laughs> for four full years now. Um, there was, we did have an original series of episodes in 2015 from, uh, I want to say March to October of 2015. That was the, the first season. Um, you know, and then life fell apart and then we didn't do it for a while. And then we realized that our lives were miserable without terrible books. So I know what a realization. Yeah. What a realization. But um, anyway, if you have any pressing questions for us, get them to us uh, very soon because we are going to be doing that episode on the 28th. So get them to us as soon as you can. All right. I think <sighs> business is concluded, Paris. All right. I got to, you know, this is good timing because I got to, fuck, I got to, oh no. Yeah. I got to check on the, I got to check on the fucking weather god tied up in the basement. It's getting, it's getting bad down there. I yeah. Gotta, Good idea. I mean, you've been letting him dehydrate for such a long time. He's probably ready to be harvested for the trickster god jerky. Yeah. You don't want to let it get too dry. That's just that's just bad. Yeah. Still gotta still gotta retain some godlike texture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, that's desirable in a jerky. All right. Well, with that, we will leave you to your I was going to say Tuesday because that's when this comes out. But who the fuck knows when you listen to this? I don't know. Your day. Have a good day. Have a good night. I don't know what time it is for you right now. Who knows? (laughs) Just hope you're having a good existence. I hope your essence is strengthened. (laughs) Bye, Paris. Okay, here's... here's, (laughs) No, but goodbye, Paris. I want everyone to know that I am not on any substances. I my brain has just been misfiring tonight. I do not know. <laughs> Woo! Sorry, y'all. Thank you for listening to episode ninety nine, and we will see you for episode one hundred live on Bye, Twitch. Paris. Bye, Paris. <laughs> November twenty eighth. into my giant mug. I just I just don't want it to be in the background of my recording. <laughs> this is gonna end up at the end of the episode, isn't it? <laughs> oh hang on, hang on. You gotta look at my mug. You gotta look at my mug. It's so good. It's so good. Is this Paris Seltzer pouring ASMR all of a sudden? <laughs> Can you move the straw in and out of the top of the hole near the microphone? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, there it is. (laughs)